stepping into history. Donald Trump becomes the first sitting U.S. president to enter North Korea. We have a report plus a recap of his trip to Asia. Threat from Tehran. Iran says it's exceeded the limit of its stockpile of a dangerous chemical, what the U.S. is saying. Sexual abuse crisis. A church leader from Illinois tells us why he spoke about the scandal to the faculty and students at Oxford University in England. And set for sainthood. The Vatican announces the date for the canonization of five new saints. We examine the life of one of them, Blessed John Henry Newman. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 1st, 2019. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Jason Calvi, in for Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump makes history. He becomes the first sitting U.S. president to step foot into North Korea. The president's meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ended his trip to Asia. White House correspondent Mark Irons tells us more. Mark? Jason, the president shook hands with a long list of world leaders this weekend at the G20 summit in Japan. But the last leg of his trip to the Korean peninsula brought one moment the world has never seen before. With a footstep, President Trump walked his way into history books, the first sitting U.S. president to enter North Korea. Stepping across that line was a great honor. A lot of progress has been made. I've never expected to meet you at this place. The impromptu meeting sparked by President Trump's Twitter invitation. He wrote, if Chairman Kim of North Korea sees this, I would meet him at the border slash DMZ just to shake his hand and say hello. About 30 hours after sending that tweet, both men were together at the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. This has been in particular a great friendship, so I just want to thank you. That was very quick notice and I want to thank you. <laughs> More than a handshake, the two leaders met privately for nearly an hour, spending unprecedented moments at the DMZ. The new White House press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, fighting for U.S. photographers to have as much access as possible. But aside from the historic photos, the chances of North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons remain out of focus. The country tested short-range missiles in May. Now President Trump says denuclearization talks could resume this month. He's even willing to have Chairman Kim come to Washington. I would invite him right now to the White House. Negotiations between the two countries have stalled since February when President Trump walked out of his second summit with Chairman Kim in Vietnam after a denuclearization deal could not be reached. Critics say the president has helped prop up Kim's regime. I personally don't believe the North Koreans have long-term any intent to denuclearize. Why should they? It's their ticket to survival. Other weekend meetings to note, President Trump met with Chinese President Xi Jinping and says trade talks with China are back on track. He also sat down with the Saudi crown prince, who, according to U.S. intelligence, ordered the murder of a Washington Post columnist last fall. The president is relying on Saudi Arabia's backing as tension rises with Iran. Jason. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thanks, Mark. And Catholic leaders push for peace on the Korean Peninsula. It's a story we first shared with you in September. One American priest based in Seoul says he's visited North Korea 50 times. You see people dying. You see kids and babies in shoeboxes left on the side of the road. Father Gerard Hammond says he visits the North to bring medical supplies. The DMZ, the demilitarized zone, was built in 1953. It's roughly 250 miles long. In the last hour, Pope Francis praises the president's visit to North Korea. He says it's a step toward peace. The Holy Father did not name either leader, though he did tell pilgrims he's praying. But several Democratic presidential candidates criticized the president's visit. Julian Castro says the trip was purely for show. It's all symbolism. It's not substance. And uh, right after the Singapore summit a year ago, he told the American people, and folks will remember this, that North Korea was no longer a threat. But it turns out that then they did uh, weapons testing after that. And Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar says President Trump needs a clear mission and goals, not just meetings. Iran says it broke limits set on its uranium stockpile. The United Nations inspectors confirmed the move. It marks the Islamic Republic's first major break from the 2015 nuclear deal. Let's go to the State Department where correspondent Wyatt Goolsby gives us reaction. Wyatt? 
Jason, good evening. Leaders from some of the biggest supporters of the nuclear deal, like Britain, France, and Germany, say they are concerned about Iran's announcement today. The three European nations are working to keep the nuclear deal in place, but with Iran's breaching the agreement and the U.S. pulling out, it's not likely to last. Iran's foreign minister says his country will move ahead with plans to raise its stockpile of enriched uranium. Mohammad Javad Zarif announced today the country crossed the 300 kilogram limit, and he says that number will jump by July 7th if the Europeans cannot offer them a new deal. Thomas Callender, a national security and foreign policy expert, says Iran is trying to blackmail the countries who signed the original accord in 2015. They would like uh, the European nations, uh, the UK, uh, Germany and France primarily, uh, to one, ignore the sanctions that the United States has imposed, specifically in, in being able to sell their oil. Calendar says President Trump's maximum pressure campaign, which includes harsh economic sanctions against Iran's top leaders, is hitting the Islamic Republic hard. The White House unilaterally removed the U.S. from the deal in May of 2018. Calendar says the deal is unraveling. Them violating it, it makes it harder for those European nations to try to stick and save the deal. So this could be the final nail in the coffin of the, of the 2015 nuclear deal. The sanctions also put pressure on ordinary Iranians who are being cut off from global markets. Ramesh Sheparad is with the Organization of Iranian American Communities, which advocates for more human rights in the country. She says inside Iran, there are growing demands the government give up power. That's why you see in the uprisings in Iran where people are shouting down with Khamenei, down with Rouhani. And reformers, hardliners, the game is over. So clearly this regime is not fit to govern the Iranian people. The Iranian people want this regime gone. Tension between the U.S. and Iran is already at an all-time high. Iran recently shot down a U.S. drone in the Persian Gulf and attacked several commercial oil tankers. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says they're willing to negotiate with Iran, but the Iranians have not been willing to come to the table. Jason. Okay, correspondent Wyatt Goolsby at the State Department. Thanks, Wyatt. And Hong Kong residents protest a proposed law. It would allow suspects to be sent to China to face trial. Police estimate some 190,000 people marched. A smaller group of protesters broke into the legislature's main building. Organizers of the peaceful protests say they numbered more than half a million. Today marks the anniversary of the former British colony's return to China. The Vatican condemns lawmakers trying to force priests to violate the seal of confession. Lawmakers in several areas around the world want priests to reveal what they hear in confession if it relates to sex abuse. Later on on News Nightly, we'll talk with Edward Condon, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. The Vatican reveals the canonization date of five people, including John Henry Newman. Newman was an Anglican minister who converted to Catholicism in the 19th century. Scholars consider his writings some of the most important in recent church history. Pope Francis will name Newman and four others saints on October 13th. Joining us now is Susan Hansen, professor at the University of Dallas. Susan, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for having me. Cardinal Newman will become Britain's first saint since 1976. What could this canonization mean to the Catholic Church in Great Britain? Well, I think that there will be inevitably a kind of outpouring of cultural pride on the part of the English because John Henry Newman, um, while of course we're canonizing him for his great holiness was also one of the great prose stylists, one of the great writers of simply beautiful, majestic English, who inspired a revival of Christian literature in the late 19th, early 20th century with a lot of influence on great poets like Gerard Manley Hopkins and other essayists like Ronald Knox and G.K. Chesterton and J.R. Tolkien. So I would think that in England, even among um, non-Catholics, there would be an enormous amount of cultural pride um, that one of, their, one of their greatest writers is being recognized by the Catholic Church um, for his sanctity. But I think more important than Great Britain, he's going to be very important for the whole English-speaking world, which is a majority Protestant world. And perhaps the most important thing about John Henry Newman is that he's a convert, that he began his life as a Protestant, as an evangelical, and that he found his way home to the Roman Catholic Church. And so I think he's going to be an important figure for the entire English-speaking world and not just Great Britain. 
So then let's talk about that conversion story. Why did, why did Newman convert to Catholicism? So Newman was a very passionate young man and passionate about his faith as an evangelical uh, member of the Church of England. And he was actually an ordained minister in the Anglican Church. Um, he went to the University of Oxford and he studied the early church founders, the, the history of early Christianity and the um, early church fathers and church councils. And he gradually, as he was trying to help the Church of England, trying to help evangelicals fight against some of the liberalizing tendencies in their own faith, he gradually started to realize um, that the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, really is um, embodied in the institutional Catholic Church. And so in, 19, in 1845, excuse me, in 1845, he became a Catholic, and sometimes this is referred to as the great going out of 45, um, when Newman, who was such a famous figure at the University of Oxford, finally made his way into the Roman Catholic Church. And it really was an enormous public event. And he dealt with a lot of anti-Catholicism. Um, and he dealt with um, that struggle with friends and family who didn't understand his decision in a very public way. So it was, it was quite an event, his conversion. And then he wrote a lot as a Catholic. He wrote previously as an Anglican. What is he best known for in his writing in the Catholic Church? Well, I think he's very famous for his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which is the story of his conversion, his autobiographical story of his conversion, um, which is beautifully written and describes coming from Oxford to Rome. And he was very influenced by a friendship with a, a young friend who he traveled with on a tour of the Mediterranean and on his first visit to Rome. And that friend became Catholic um, and died very young. And so he was very influenced by his friendship um, and, and influenced by the community of friends who he had made um, in Oxford and all of their, their struggles to find the truth. And he really talked about it as a coming home, a homecoming to the Catholic Church. Well, we're going to be learning a lot more about him until his canonization in October. Professor Susan Hansen of the University of Dallas, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. Coming up, a church leader tells us about the reaction to his lecture at Oxford University on clergy sex abuse. Plus, why the Trump administration is delaying one of its pro-life measures. Benedict XVI meets with the American ambassador to the Holy See. The U.S. Embassy shares this picture of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI with Ambassador Callista Gingrich and her husband, Newt Gingrich. The ambassador says she and the former Speaker of the House were truly honored to meet Benedict. Thanks for watching EWTN News Nightly. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. The Trump administration agrees to delay one of its pro-life measures. The rule would protect medical workers who refuse to do abortions. It was set to go into effect this month, but it's now on hold as it's challenged in a California court. A U.S. Catholic bishop shares his experiences of fighting sex abuse allegations. Bishop Thomas Paprocki of the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois gave two lectures at the University of Oxford. One of those lectures examined what he calls myths surrounding the abuse crisis. Bishop Paprocki is back home talking to us on Skype. Your Excellency, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Good to be with you. Now, you pointed out that nothing has been released regarding the Vatican's investigation into former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Why is that inf information so important? Well, I think it's important for us to know uh, what transpired uh, in that case. And uh, the Holy Father uh, promised last October that uh, that information would be uh, released, that they would have to go through their records. And it's my understanding that they're, they're working on that, and uh, hopefully that will be released soon. Did they give you any timetable about when that may be released? No. No, not really. I think they want to be thorough with that. They want to make sure that they're um, not going to just release things in, in snippets, so to speak, uh, and make sure that they have everything together. So I think they're trying to be very thorough with that and hopefully uh, uh, get that out uh, soon. Okay. Now, before your trip to the UK, I know your brother, American bishops, and yourself gathered in Baltimore, and you debated how to respond to this ongoing crisis. How will these plans help? Well, I think they'll help because it's a, it's a further step. It's a further progression. Uh, the reason I gave this talk at Oxford University uh, last week was because I wanted to share some of my experiences on this. I've been working on this issue of handling allegations of clerical sexual misconduct with minors since 1992, when I was appointed Chancellor of the Archdiocese 
of Chicago, and we set up our first uh, review board in the United States. And so that experience through the 1990s uh, led to the adoption of review boards throughout the country with the, uh, the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People and the Essential Norms. And now this further progression is that uh, adopt adopting some steps that will be applicable to bishops because uh, back in 2002, we had a, uh, a statement of pledging that we would uh, cooperate with those same restrictions that uh, and same procedures that were put on priests. But now these uh, new procedures that were put in place uh, last month uh, in Baltimore take this a step further by uh, clearly outlining some policies and procedures that are uh, enforceable and uh, have to be dealt with not only here, but then with the matters being referred uh, to the Holy See through the Apostolic Nuncio in Washington, D.C. And these plans come after a great anger and, and disappointment and sadness, as you talk about in your speech. And one of the things that you talk about here, one of the main myths about the sexual abuse of minors, you say, is that it is not, it, that it is, one of the myths is it's only a Catholic problem. Why do you think people feel that way? Well, I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of the mainstream media has portrayed that, that picture. And even the reports that have come out, like the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report and the uh, Illinois Attorney General have painted this out to be a Catholic problem. So I try to confront that myth that it's a Catholic problem by showing that other denominations are also dealing with this issue. I try to confront the myth that it is uh, simply a priest problem by uh, showing that there are other professions that do deal with this problem. And also the, the myth that it's a celibacy problem by pointing to the fact that uh, a great deal of uh, child sexual abuse unfortunately occurs in families and involves married men. So I try to confront these things showing that if we're going to be serious about confronting uh, sexual abuse of minor, minors, and I think we do want to be serious about that, that we really have to look uh, beyond uh, the issues of, of priests. Now, as terrible as that has been uh, in terms of uh, priests uh, abusing minors, we also have to look to see where it's happening in our schools, our public schools, and in, in our families, in our homes, because as, as a bishop, I have a pastoral concern uh, for these children. And, and we actually have more uh, Catholic children in public schools than we have in Catholic schools. So we have to be concerned about their welfare as well. And one of the things you point out in your lecture is, is the fact that this abuse is happening in the schools, it's happening in, in various other places. And you say to not, to, you know, you, you point out a, a journalism, a newspaper article, it was on the front page of your local paper, and then there was another article about uh, school abuse, and that was buried deep inside. Why do you think the media has, has done that? Why, why, do you, why do you think that is? Well, I think these uh, the stories about uh, priests uh, breaking their vows uh, appeal to a certain sensationalism uh, that uh, that they like to report on. But, uh, uh, you know, so I, I do talk about that. But the reality is in my own diocese, for example, since I've been a bishop here for nine years now, since 2010, I've removed one priest uh, for allegations that occurred uh, back in the 1980s. In the meanwhile, uh, in the meantime, we've, we've got these reports of, of hundreds of cases uh, occurring uh, in the public school system. And, uh, and th those stories tend to get uh, buried a little further back. Now, granted, you know, we priests, in a sense, are held to a higher standard, and I acknowledge that. So when, even if there's one case, it's, it's something that is, is a terrible thing. But again, if we're really going to be concerned about the, the safety of children, we have to look uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the issue of what's happening with clergy and beyond the issue of what's happening just in the Catholic Church to look at other uh, segments of our society where this is also a very uh, important and, and uh, pressing problem. Okay, Bishop Thomas Paprocki of the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Up next, analysis of the Vatican statement defending the seal of confession. And U.S. officials attend an event in Jerusalem related to the life of Christ. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. The Vatican today defends the seal of the confessional, that everything said in the sacrament is completely secret. As we reported earlier tonight, the Vatican condemns lawmakers trying to force priests to violate the seal. Let's talk with Edward Condon, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Ed, welcome back. Nice to be here. So the note signed by the Apostolic Penitentiary says priests should therefore defend the seal of the sacrament up to the point of shedding their own blood. What does this mean? It means exactly what the church has always taught, which is that the secrecy of the sacrament of confession is an integral part of the sacrament itself, that it's not something the church puts on it as a sort of extra layer of discipline or a precautionary measure. 
it's essential to how the sacrament is lived by Catholics and has always been that way. So this is in the midst of places like uh, California trying to incur or force priests to reveal what said in the sacrament regarding child abuse. Uh, what does this document mean for priests in California and other uh, across the world, actually? Well, it's really just a letter of encouragement for those priests. I mean, we've seen in California, but also in other countries like um, Puerto Rico recently, um, Australia had a Royal Commission report last year recommending similar laws that are being passed in state-by-state -state basis there, saying that really the, the seal of the confession is somehow an impediment to full transparency and, and most importantly puts children at risk in light of abuse scandals. Now, there's no evidence to suggest this whatsoever. Nowhere has there turned up any evidence that the seal of confession or confessional secrecy was in some way part or even a contributing factor in any of the child abuse scandals in the church, but it's an easy target for a lot of civil jurisdictions. They like to take shots at it. And this is a bedrock issue of religious liberty for the church. There simply isn't the sacrament of confession without this guarantee of secrecy. What would happen if a priest heard a confession, somebody confessed this sin of child abuse? What would the priest do at that point to encourage justice? Well, the priest can obviously exhort the person in the confessional to, you know, <laughs> refrain from sin, surely, to convert, to amend their ways, and can even encourage them to put to report themselves to the civil authorities. But let's be clear, these sort of images that we often see uh, on television and in films of priests, for example, withholding absolution from a penitent unless they turn themselves into civil authorities. This is not part of the sacrament of confession. When you go to confession, you only need to do certain things to have an, a valid confession and absolution. You have to confess your sins, you have to sincerely intend not to repeat them, and you have to manifest true contrition. Now, if they do this, then it's the job of the priest to absolve them. Now, he has some discernment within the scope of the confessional to make sure that the person is truly penitent, truly is intending to avoid the near occasion of sin in the future. But it's not the job of the priest in the confessional to make a report to civil authorities, that when he's in the confessional, he's acting in the person of Christ. He's bringing that ministry to that individual. But, as has often been the case, if a People raise the condition of, well, what if a child reports its own abuse in the confessional? Can't the priest do something there? The priest can absolutely tell the child that he needs to tell their parents. He needs to tell even the priest outside of the confessional. There's nothing wrong with that. But what we can't do is start obliging priests in a civil forum to start violating the seal of confession. So this six-page document has some very strong words in it. it. It refers to the sacrament, the sanctity of confession being an anecdote to evil. What does that mean? Well, really, when we talk about evil in the world, there is only one thing the church proposes as an answer to evil in the world, which is the salvation brought through the church in the sacraments. Now, when you consider that the source and summit of the church's life is the Eucharist, that's the most important sacrament in that sense. But through baptism, we have the forgiveness of sins. Before we approach the Eucharist, we're supposed to make sure that we've, we've got right with God, as it were, that we've confessed our sins, that we're in a state of grace, that really our daily conversion as Christians hinges on this sacrament of an examination of our own conscience and meeting the mercy of God. This is something Pope Francis has spoken about over and over again in recent years. Ed Conan, so much to dissect in this six-page document. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it very much. D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks for having me. And finally tonight, you can soon walk an ancient road in Jerusalem. The archaeological find is 2,000 years old, dating from the time of Christ. To, to feel the steps of Jesus as he walked as a Jewish pilgrim, as he ascended to the temple, his visits, of course, to the temple, well known and well documented. This is not a relic. It's not an antiquity. It's not something from the past. It's something that is intact today. The sponsor, the City of David Foundation, says Pilgrimage Road brought visitors to the ancient Jewish temple. Soon, people will be able to walk the route through a 350-yard tunnel. I'm Jason Calvi, and for the entire EWTN News Nightly team, thanks for watching tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night, and God bless you.